A series of earthquakes struck off the coast of Vancouver Island today. Some quakes as strong as magnitude 6. A silent giant off the coast of British Columbia is no longer sleeping. New seismic data and satellite imagery reveal a disturbing trend. The subduction zone beneath Vancouver Island is surging with activity. What was once a slow, creeping interface between tectonic plates is now showing signs of sudden movement, raising serious concerns among geologists, emergency planners, and coastal communities alike. This isn't just a tremor or two. This is a region-wide deformation event along one of the most dangerous seismic zones on Earth, the Cascadia subduction zone, and it may be the early signal of something no one wants to imagine. What is the Cascadia subduction zone and why it terrifies scientists? The Cascadia subduction zone stretches over 1,000 kilometers, 620 miles, from Northern California to British Columbia. It's where the oceanic Juan de Fuca plate slides beneath the North American plate, a tectonic collision zone capable of producing megathrust earthquakes and devastating tsunamis. The last known full rupture of this zone occurred on January 26, 1700, an estimated magnitude 8.7 to 9.2 event that sent a massive tsunami across the Pacific, reaching as far as Japan. Historical records from Japan describe an orphan tsunami that struck without any accompanying earthquake, later matched with geologic records from North America. Tree ring data and sediment layers in coastal marshes confirm massive coastal subsidence and inundation from that same event. Indigenous oral histories from coastal First Nations also recount powerful shaking and flooding, adding an essential layer of historical corroboration. Since then, the fault has been unusually quiet, too quiet. This silence, known as a seismic gap, worries scientists because it suggests the plates are locked and accumulating strain that will eventually need to be released. The longer the interval between quakes, the more stress builds increasing the potential magnitude of the next rupture. Statistically, Cascadia is overdue. Based on recurrence intervals estimated from paleo seismic data, scientists estimate a major rupture occurs roughly every 250 to 500 years. The Cascadia subduction zone is segmented into four primary sections, northern, central, southern, and a transition zone, USGS, alert, that low-frequency tremors detected in the region, along with ETS events and unusual ground deformation. One of the most closely monitored areas is the northern segment offshore of Vancouver Island. This region is now showing signs of increased seismic chatter, low-frequency tremors, episodic tremor, and slip at ETS events and strange deformation patterns, all red flags that the tectonic system is shifting. Complicating matters is the presence of a thick sedimentary wedge atop the subducting plate, which could amplify shaking when a rupture occurs. Additionally, the interface between the plates is not smooth. It's jagged and irregular, which can cause uneven locking and increase rupture complexity. Submarine mapping reveals multiple asperities, stuck patches along the fault that act as pressure points and potential nucleation zones for future earthquakes. Adding to the concern is the regional tectonic context. Not only is the Juan de Fuca plate subducting beneath North America, but the surrounding region is under compressional stress from the Pacific and North American plates. This three-way interaction contributes to crustal warping and localized intraplate earthquakes, creating a web of seismic vulnerability. Why is this so alarming? Because unlike standard earthquakes, which give off strong shock waves as they occur, subduction zones can store energy silently for centuries before snapping violently. When they do, the resulting quakes can last several minutes and unleash massive tsunamis. The consequences could be catastrophic, not just for Vancouver, but for the entire Pacific Northwest. So the question now is, 
how much longer can this fault remain silent before nature decides to speak again? In SAR and GPS, a disturbing pattern emerges. In SAR and GPS, a disturbing pattern emerges. Satellite-based INSAR, interferometric synthetic aperture radar data combined with land-based GPS stations is now showing a disturbing trend. Vertical and horizontal movement along the Vancouver Island coastline that deviates from typical tectonic drift. Normally, the Juan de Fuca plate subducts smoothly beneath the North American plate, but recent satellite passes from ESA's Sentinel-1 satellite show uplift of nearly three centimeters, just over one inch across large areas in less than two months, an abnormal rate for a region previously assumed to be locked. GPS stations along the coast are also recording lateral movement rates far exceeding long-term background averages, pointing to increased tectonic stress being transferred inland. This isn't just a gradual adjustment. It's a sudden acceleration in tectonic strain, possibly indicating that the interface between plates is no longer slipping gently, but grinding to a halt and storing energy. Such deformation could be indicative of a locked fault segment, one that is resisting motion and building up pressure that will eventually be released in a seismic rupture. What makes the data even more alarming is its spatial consistency. The deformation is not localized to one anomaly, but spread across a 200-kilometer segment of the fault. This suggests a broad-scale change in stress distribution, potentially involving deep magmatic or tectonic shifts. Some regions are also showing signs of shear motion, lateral movement along fault planes that further hints at evolving rupture dynamics. This uplift is also accompanied by a lateral shift to the northeast, suggesting elastic rebound of the crust. In layman's terms, it's the kind of motion you'd expect to see before a massive seismic release. Elastic rebound theory describes how strain builds up in rocks until it's released during an earthquake, causing the land to snap back to a more relaxed state. Geophysicists at the Geological Survey of Canada are currently analyzing the combined INSAR and GPS datasets to determine if this marks the beginning of a megathrust earthquake cycle. Preliminary models suggest that if stress accumulation continues at this rate, the system may enter a critical state within months or years, a timeline that remains deeply uncertain yet uncomfortably plausible. Deep tremor and slip, the silent alarm. One of the most intriguing and alarming phenomena now being observed is an uptick in deep episodic tremor and slip, ETS, events. ETS occurs deep within subduction zones, where plates slide past each other quietly, generating low-frequency tremors and slow motion rather than sudden quakes. These silent slips were once considered harmless, but now scientists believe they could act as triggers or precursors for major seismic ruptures. ETS events can last for days or even weeks, and while they don't produce surface-shaking earthquakes themselves, they can redistribute stress along the fault in unpredictable ways. In the past three weeks alone, over 2,300 tremors have been recorded beneath southern Vancouver Island, three times the usual frequency during an ETS cycle. These tremors are migrating northwestward toward the locked portion of the subduction interface, precisely the area most capable of generating a magnitude 9.0 quake. The direction and speed of this tremor migration are significant. Scientists have noted that these slow-moving swarms are advancing at a rate of approximately 10 kilometers per day. This may seem slow, but for geological processes, it's rapid and it's bringing stress closer to the rupture-prone locked zone. The key concern, these deep tremors may be transferring stress to shallower sections of the fault, potentially destabilizing the already fragile boundary. Modeling studies from past ETS episodes have shown that cumulative tremor activity can be followed by heightened seismic sensitivity in nearby faults. It's like tapping a cracked window repeatedly. It might not shatter the first time, but each tap brings it closer to breaking. New sensor arrays installed across southern British Columbia are detecting subtle fluid pressure changes that coincide with ETS activity. These changes may indicate fluids are being pushed upward along fractures. 
further weakening the rock above and potentially enabling rupture. And if the locked zone gives way, the result could be a rupture that stretches for hundreds of kilometers along the Cascadia margin, devastating coastal communities and sending tsunamis across the Pacific. Is this the beginning of the next big one? The million dollar question, is this just a normal fluctuation in tectonic stress or the early stages of a catastrophic earthquake? Seismologists are cautious. While the data is concerning, it's not yet definitive. However, there are troubling signs. First, the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network has reported an increase in micro-earthquakes at shallow depths beneath the coast, clustered along fault lines that typically activate before larger events. These quakes are small, but they're new, and they're in places that suggest stress is moving. Some of these quakes appear in swarms, exhibiting similar waveforms and focal mechanisms, which may indicate stress-triggered fracturing along specific fault planes. Second, borehole strain meters in the region have recorded changes in tilt and pressure, indicating that the crust is bending and storing elastic energy. These instruments, which measure strain at sub-centimeter levels, have shown signals that closely resemble pre-event patterns observed before major quakes in Chile, 2010, and Japan, 2011. These comparisons are raising eyebrows within the scientific community. Coastal vulnerability. What's at risk? If the subduction zone does rupture, the consequences could be disastrous. A full-margin Cascadia earthquake would unleash shaking across British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. Cities like Victoria, Vancouver, and Seattle could experience severe structural damage, landslides, and fires. Many older buildings in these regions are not retrofitted for seismic events of this scale, making them especially vulnerable to collapse. Critical infrastructure, such as bridges, overpasses, and emergency response centers could be rendered inoperable at the moment they're needed most. But perhaps more terrifying is the tsunami that would follow. Generated within minutes, this wall of water could hit coastal towns like Tofino, Ucluele, and Port Alberni within 15 to 30 minutes, giving residents little time to evacuate. Low-lying areas could be completely inundated, and the second and third waves, which often follow the initial surge, could bring additional destruction. Emergency siren systems may be overwhelmed, particularly if communications infrastructure is damaged during the quake. Inland areas may escape the waves, but not the economic impact. Ports, pipelines, and electrical grids could be crippled. British Columbia's coastal ports play a major role in North American trade networks. Damage to these would have ripple effects far beyond the region. Supply chains could freeze, particularly for food, fuel, and medical supplies. Thousands could be displaced. Billions in damage could unfold in just hours, and full recovery could take years. Secondary hazards would likely include fires sparked by gas leaks, hazardous material spills at industrial sites, and dam failures in upstream reservoirs. Emergency response capabilities would be severely tested, especially in rural and coastal communities with limited resources. Emergency management agencies are now reviewing evacuation maps, tsunami models, and public alert systems. They are also staging simulation drills and upgrading early warning technology but experts agree, if a major rupture occurs, the best protection is awareness, planning, and rapid execution of preparedness protocols. Ecosystem and Oceanic Impact The Cascadia subduction zone isn't just a human hazard, it's an ecological flashpoint. If the fault ruptures, vast sections of the ocean floor could rise or fall by several meters, instantly altering seafloor habitats and disrupting marine life. Hydrothermal vents, cold water coral reefs, and fish spawning zones could be annihilated or buried under landslides. Some of these ecosystems have taken thousands of years to form, and their destruction could eliminate species not yet fully studied by science. The seabed upheaval may also displace methane hydrates, ice-like deposits that trap methane gas within sediments. If released, this potent greenhouse gas could contribute to short-term climate effects 
and create hypoxic conditions in surrounding waters, further stressing marine organisms. Estuaries along the BC coast, critical for salmon and other species, could be inundated with salt water, changing their chemistry for years. Shifts in salinity and sediment load could reduce reproductive success among fish and shellfish, impacting food webs and local economies dependent on commercial fisheries. Inland lakes fed by coastal streams might see sudden shifts in water level and turbidity. These changes could suffocate fish populations and increase the likelihood of toxic algal blooms. Even migratory bird roots could be disrupted by changes in forest and shoreline morphology, uprooted trees, saltwater intrusion into nesting zones, and the destruction of wetland buffers may push some bird populations to collapse or migrate further north, impacting broader biodiversity corridors across the Pacific Northwest. And then there's the threat of underwater landslides. If triggered, these could generate secondary tsunamis or sediment clouds that choke coastal waters, impacting everything from fisheries to aquaculture operations. Filter feeders like clams and mussels would be especially vulnerable to smothering by sediment plumes. The environment would not be spared in the aftermath of a Cascadia rupture. Conservation efforts may take decades to restore damaged ecosystems, and some losses could be permanent. What scientists are doing now? Monitoring efforts are intensifying. Monitoring efforts are intensifying. Geologists have increased seismic station coverage on Vancouver Island and are deploying ocean bottom seismometers along the fault trench. These instruments will help detect micro seismicity and stress changes with greater precision, especially in subsea areas previously under monitored. USGS alert that new LIDAR scans detect detailed ground shifts, revealing slope instability and subsidence risks. New LIDAR flights are mapping terrain deformation in detail, capturing centimeter-level ground movement in areas vulnerable to slope failure and subsidence. This high-resolution imagery allows scientists to build dynamic topographic models and track even the most subtle changes in the Earth's surface. Underwater drones are scanning the seabed for stress fractures, venting gases, and unusual biological activity that might signal increased hydrothermal output. Some of these autonomous drones are equipped with magnetometers and temperature sensors to detect heat anomalies and shifts in magnetic signatures that often accompany tectonic stress changes. These real-time feeds provide invaluable insight into fault zone behavior that cannot be captured from land. Real-time AI-assisted modeling is also being used to simulate potential rupture scenarios, testing everything from partial margin events to full zone quakes exceeding magnitude 9. These simulations are enhanced using 4D geodynamic modeling platforms that incorporate deformation data, fluid dynamics, and pressure gradients across the subduction interface. These models help refine predictive forecasts and identify which areas are most likely to fail first. In short, every available tool is being brought to bear. Some scientists have called this surge in monitoring a tectonic sprint, a race to understand and anticipate a potentially catastrophic event before it occurs. It's not a panic, but it is a red alert, a call to pay attention, not just to today's data, but to what it could mean tomorrow. The science is still catching up, but the stakes are already clear. The ground off Vancouver is changing, and the Cascadia subduction zone has stirred once again. Will it slip quietly back into place, or is this the beginning of something far more dangerous? We can't know yet, but we can prepare. What do you think? Is this the big one, or just tectonic noise? Like this video if you want to see more real-time geoscience breakdowns. Subscribe and hit the bell so you're the first to know when Earth makes its next move. Because in Cascadia, the silence doesn't mean safety. It means we need to listen even closer.